Welcome to the drawing board. Periodically, the Federal Reserve compiles and releases independent economic forecasts put together by the members of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors in Washington and the 12 Reserve Bank Presidents who represent all the regions of our country. But have you ever wondered what goes into these forecasts and what they're meant to do? On the surface, it may seem pretty simple. Why does anyone forecast anything? It's so we have some notion of what the future will look like so we can plan accordingly. After all, you watch the weather report to see if you'll need to take your raincoat or your sunscreen when you leave the house in the morning. But comparing an economic forecast at the Federal Reserve to a weather forecast doesn't really work. While some economic forecasts are only concerned with making projections about the future of the economy, it's much more complicated at the Fed. In addition to wanting to know as much as we can about where the economy will be down the road, we're in a unique position. First, the monetary policy actions we take have a significant impact on the direction of the economy. When we raise, lower, or keep the federal funds rate the same, it generally affects how financial markets react in the short term and how economic conditions evolve over a longer period. For instance, a change in the Fed funds rate, the rate at which banks can borrow from one another overnight, or even a decision to stand pat, it might, over the course of 6 to 18 months, influence the price of goods and services, the employment rate, the output level of businesses, even the gross domestic product, or GDP, which is a measure of our country's overall economic output. Second, Congress mandates that our decisions promote stable prices and maximum employment, and that has a huge impact on our forecasting. Our forecasting needs to tell us not just what the future might look like, but how the decisions we make today will likely move the economy in ways that keep prices stable and people employed over the long term. So what each Reserve Bank President and member of the Board of Governors does when they create their forecasts is produce a range of possible ways the economy might react to actions we may take. They each pick the outcome they believe is the most likely and submit it to the Secretary of the Federal Open Market Committee, or FOMC. Then, when the FOMC meets in Washington to decide on monetary policy, and that happens eight times a year, the committee members use the various forecasts as the basis for discussions when they decide what the monetary policy strategy will be for the near term and over the longer run. Throughout much of the Fed's recent history, monetary policy has been largely focused on setting the level of the federal funds rate and shaping market expectations about the future path of the funds rate. As for the shaping of expectations, that's done through the statement the FOMC releases after it meets, which provides some description of how the economy is performing and trending. However, in responding to the crisis, the Federal Reserve has done more than just adjust the Fed funds rate. Besides lowering the rate to a range of zero to one quarter percent, it also employed other tools, such as asset purchases, to provide additional stimulus to the economy. So going back to our weather forecast analogy, forecasting at the Fed is like trying to predict the weather while having some ability to affect weather conditions and some idea of what kind of weather we want in the future. That's the process in a nutshell. But what about those individual forecasts? What goes into them? As I mentioned, they're independent by design. Each player in the process, the members of the board and the 12 Reserve Bank presidents, they all look at and interpret economic data in slightly different ways. That's one of the strengths of the approach. Having a wide range of perspectives from all across the nation ensures that the Federal Reserve's forecasts and subsequent monetary policy decisions are based on broad, varied, and rich perspectives. While a forecast is comprised of more detail and mathematics than we can discuss in the short time we have, we can at least talk about the three essential components of any economic forecast data, models, and judgment. Let's take a look at each. Data is the raw information we have that tells us how the economy has performed in the past. Things like the GDP, price indexes, which track the prices of goods and services, payroll employment, which tracks the number of people being paid wages, the unemployment rate, lots and lots of historical data. And why do we care about what's happened in the past? Well, Mark Twain once famously said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Or if you prefer, there's a quote by George Santayana, who says, those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. Bottom line, 
History often provides insight into where the economy may be heading based on ways the economy has performed under similar situations in the past. But data alone doesn't tell us much. It's just facts and figures. There's no context. Looking solely at data would be like looking at a bunch of individual musical notes. Each note by itself wouldn't add up to anything. But when you string the notes together in a score, they produce a song. The score puts the notes into a framework for understanding, so to speak, and that's pretty much what a model does in an economic forecast. A model is a way of arranging and looking at data in a particular way so we can form a picture of how the economy might be performing, based on our assumptions and our knowledge of how certain economic data has tended to interact with each other in the past. As I mentioned, each Reserve Bank president and board member creates a forecast based on his or her assumptions about the direction of the economy, based on how the current data is aligning or not aligning with the historical data. The final piece in our forecasting puzzle is judgment, which in this context can be described as weighing the balance between the force of history, which is the data and models we've been talking about so far, and the force of current events. At a given point in time, one or the other may be having a greater influence, and it's not always that easy to see which. You have to use judgment to determine just how closely conditions in the current marketplace are following historical trends, or how far away they're drifting from those trends. Forecasting is a lot like driving a car on a road you've taken many times before, but that might have undergone some construction since the last time you were on it that requires you to navigate the road a little differently. Let me give you a couple of examples where the Federal Reserve altered its course based on its assessment of conditions in the economy that didn't track with historical patterns, times it had to consider that the familiar road might take an unusual turn. The first is the tech boom of the 1990s. In the middle of that decade, the models projecting where the economy was heading were telling us that productivity growth, based on expectations derived from historical trends, should be somewhere between 1.5 and 2 percent. But the Federal Open Market Committee recognized that a boom fueled by new technology was likely going to push the productivity growth rates higher. So the FOMC set monetary policy to accommodate for this. As it turned out, productivity rates did go up to more than 3% in 1998 and in 1999. Had the FOMC relied solely on historical models and not exercised judgment, its monetary policy would have been less effective. Then there's the current economic crisis. The initial phase of this recession was moderate and heavily connected to slowing in the housing sector. But things began to spiral downward quickly, and the FOMC realized that relying on information about how previous recessions had behaved wasn't going to be enough because conditions in the economy at the time were significantly different than what we'd seen before. In the end, it was largely judgment that led the Federal Reserve to take a series of emergency measures aimed at shoring up the financial system. Now, some have argued that we, and many others, should have recognized conditions were changing sooner than we did. Reasonable and informed people can have different opinions about whether particular decisions are wise in the moment. But the truth is, forecasting is difficult under normal circumstances and even more challenging during uncertain economic times. And yet, without it, where would we be? Imagine trying to drive down that road we spoke of before, blindfolded, and with no recollection of the road you've traveled. Forecasting, while not perfect, is an integral part of understanding how to navigate the economic world we live in. And it helps us make the most informed decisions we can. Something to think about until the next time on the drawing board.